their spirits were and heading to Zambian tradition. They are believed to be responsible and condition, for example, dumbness, good spirits. So why are they called guardian possession spirits? This is which advise people. It's consulted for because they believe that good spirits are welcome. Spirits. So in Zambian tradition, what are the of nature? These spirits are not welcome. Zambian tradition. This is because they control certain parts of nature. So for example, forests, rivers, and mountains. Forests, rivers, and And remember, we are just concentrating on Zambian tradition, not Christianity, not Islam, not Hinduism. The bad spirits and the dissatisfied spir spirits. Spirits. So in Zambian tradition, they use charms. These are natural. options which are put on doors. So in Zambian tradition for them to keep the spirits away, that's the bad spirit and the dissatisfied spirits, they use charms. So in another method, lotion. So the second method, this is way prepared to keep on. So it is believed like the smell of the body. So they believe that these dissatisfied spirits and bad spirits, they hate the smell of the lotion, so they are kept away. That is how they keep bad spirits. So tattoos is one way of keeping spirits away. So what are these tattoos? So when we look at the body, Things and medicine. So in Zambian chapter number four, the use of taboos. These are strict rules. So following, for example, not eating particular foods not eating particular food in Zambian tradition. So taboos, these are strict rules or instructions.
So these are the four ways or methods of keeping tuned and and these spirits. What kinds of spirit, like I area mentioned, we've looked at the four kinds of spirits. I've got different attitude towards them. We have got those from Eastern Province, they have got their own. So when we look at these good spirits, they are welcome. So the second one, bad spirits, conditions. So these certain spirits are driven away. So the person who is possessed will be dancing. So drumming and dancing goes together. So this is how they treat the spirits or how they drive our spirits when a person is possessed. So apart from this, there are also special ceremonies. So there are special ceremonies which are carried away. And during these ceremonies, they also use rituals. There are rituals which are performed on that particular person. So we are done with today's uh, lesson, which was Jesus' power over evil spirit and how they are treated and how they possess people. So let me just give you a summary on what I just explained. I said there are four kinds of spirits in Zambian tradition. We have ancestral spirits, dissatisfied spirits, bad spirits, and also good spirits. Then we also looked at uh, methods of keeping spirits away. How do we keep these spirits away in Zambian tradition? I've said we use charms, lotions, tattoos, and also taboos. Then we have also looked at attitude to and treatment of spirits in Zambian tradition. What are some of the attitude towards these spirits? For the good spirits, since they act as overseers and protectors of the living, they are not kept away. So meaning they are welcome according to Zambian tradition. Then bad spirits, these are responsible for certain diseases and conditions. So in Zambian tradition, they are not welcome. Then ancestral spirits, According to Zambian tradition, these are spirits of the departed. So in Zambian tradition, they are welcome, they are worshipped because they do not possess people but protect and oversee them. Then treatment of spirit position in Zambia. We have looked at four ways of driving these spirits. We have said use of charms, drumming, dancing, and special ceremonies which are performed on that particular person who is possessed and rituals are done for that person. So this is what I had for you. At this particular time, if there are any questions, any messages, you can send or call direct so that I attend to you. Okay, at this particular time, let me say bye-bye, let's meet next week.
Yes, good afternoon viewers and learners out there. I would like to thank you so much for joining me uh, in the next 30 to 40 minutes of this physics session, grade 10. I'll be with you, Mr. Bandroy Dales. So today, it's PHY, grade 10. Due to the demand, and I've noticed to say most of our students do make mistakes when it comes to linear motion. To be precise, dealing with questions related to three important equations of motion. So I thought of today we just try to deal with this part. Uh, we'll deal with the equations of motions to precise deal with problems. Involving bodies bodies moving with uniform constant accretion can often be solved quickly using the equations of motion. So, notice most students or learners out there do make mistakes when dealing with the, dealing with problems involving bodies moving with the uniform and cost of discretion can often be solved quickly by using the equations of motion. So, if you look at this part, I think you do understand from the term motion. Motion is something that is moving, okay? We consider that to be in motion. So in this particular case, we look at three important equations of motions. Three important equations of motions. I'll try to list them down here. Number one, it's V equals U plus AT. The second one is S is equal to UT plus half AT squared. And the last but not the least, we do have V squared is equal to U squared plus 2 AS. It's important, learners, that you need to take note of this and you just have to know these three important equations of motions. They are so important that when you're dealing with questions, dealing with a body, you moving in a uh, uh, moving with uniform constant acceleration, then these can apply these three equations of motion. Now, I'll try, we still proceed with and what is V, what is U, what is AT. Remember that V is called the final velocity. V, we refer to it as final velocity. U is called the initial velocity. Initial velocity. Our A is acceleration. Then our T is time taken. We also have what we call, what else have we left out here? We do have 
our S. This is distance covered. I think uh, including what these abbreviations here or, or the letters that you might call them, the letters maybe that you see here, what they mean here. As a physicist, it's important that you have to know what V and for T. And so V is the final velocity, U initial velocity, A acceleration, T is the time taken, and S the distance covered. There are certain books that instead of S, they use X, present distance. They're just one and the same. Please don't get confused. They're just one and the same. But remember again, at the same time, in as much as you have to know uh, what these letters stand for you must know the SI units, that is international standards of units. So in this case, we do have our V, the SI units, it's in meters per second. We also have got our U here, it's in meters per second. Our acceleration here, it's meters per second squared, or meters per square second. We do also have our T here. Please, the SI unit for time is second, which we write as S. Then the last part here, well, S, we say distance. The SI unit for distance, it's in meters. So we write as small letter M. So please make sure you must know what are the SI units for each and every. statement has been given here. So in this case, we have said it's meters per second, meters per second, meters per square second, or meters per second squared. Uh, for time, yes, S, and distance here, meters. Now, I think you can now try to proceed since on how we can apply these three equations of motions since we have known even SI units here. Let's try to look at the first example for today. And the first example reads to say, this is the first example. The first example say a car, a car travel at 10 meters a second. Accelerates at two meters per square second for three seconds. What is its velocity? What is its velocity? We have a question to say, a car travel at 10 meters per second accelerates at two meters per square second for three seconds. What is its velocity? Now, first thing, you must do as a good student, you have to come up with your data. You must ask yourself in this question, what have you been given in this particular question here? So we can start identifying a car travel at 10 meters per second, accelerates at two meters per square second for three seconds. What is its velocity? So. According to our data, according to the information that has been given here, remember this vehicle was moving at 10 meters per second, meaning that's the starting point here. So we take it as our initial velocity, which is U. So our initial velocity is 10 meters per second. What else have we been given here? We've been given our acceleration here to be two meters per square second. So our acceleration is two meters per square second. What else? We have also been given the time here. So in this case, our time is three seconds. Now, we can proceed. So looking at the three important equations of motion that I've listed down here, you must ask yourself to say, among these, which one will apply? And looking at the data that we've listed down, if you check at the first one, do we know S? Do we have V here? The second one, we do not know. The third one, we know, we do not know V. 
first, but we know our initial, our acceleration, but S is lacking, okay? So definitely we go to our equation one. So our equation one in this case qualifies to sort out this question here. So let's try meaning V is equal to U plus 18. Please, it's very important at the same time, before you solve any question, you have to write the formula. It's a mark on its own, meaning you know what you're doing. So in this case, we try to substitute. Our initial velocity in this case is 10 plus acceleration is 2. Multiply, put in brackets, multiply by 3. So if you try to sort it out, our V is equal to 10 plus 2 multiplied by 3 is 6. Therefore, final velocity will be 16 meters per second as our final answer or the expected answer is 16 meters per second. So, hope you're following. Let's try to proceed and try to look at uh, the second part uh, of our today's Wait. sort out these questions, uh, I thought of trying to indicate the three equations of motion that we are trying to look at today on how we can apply them. So the first one, we said V is equal to U plus 18. Then the second one, we said S is equal to UT plus half 80 squared. And the third one, which is V squared, is equal to U squared plus Yes, I think uh, as we try to sort out these questions that are coming, it's important that we have them here. Take note. So let's try to look at the second example for today. Uh, the second example say a motorcycle, a motorcycle. A motorcycle. A motorcycle starting from rest. Starting from rest, acquires a velocity of the door kilometers per hour in five seconds. A, what is its its acceleration? What is its acceleration? And that would be it's uh, how far does it travel? Does it travel during this time? During this time. So this is our example two for today. So example two. Hope you have copied the first part of the exam. Now, we do have our question here to say a motorcycle starting from rest acquires a velocity of 72 kilometers per hour in five seconds. What is its acceleration? What is its acceleration? Okay. Let's look at the solution. Now, let's come up with our data this side. So 
So if you try to check, say, a motorcycle starting from rest, the moment you just hear it say it is coming from rest, just know that uh, our initial velocity in this case is zero meters per second. So our initial velocity is zero meters per second. And we've been told, say, this motorcycle uh, acquires a velocity of 72 kilometers per hour in five seconds. So we do have our final velocity to be 72 kilometers per yeah. hour. What else? Our time here has been given as our t to be five seconds. Now, if we check, we do have our three equations of motions. Which one will be applicable? Looking at what we've been given there, I think if you check here, the first one applies. So we do have our v is equal to u plus a t. So the first equation v is equal to We do have our V is equal to U plus 18. Now, one thing you must ask yourself is, what are they asking in this question? What are they asking us to find? Okay, what are they trying to ask? Now, uh, second, so there will be need for us to try to change this 72 kilometers per hour to meters per second, and how do we do that? So remember, we do have our 72 kilometers per hour. This one has to be converted to, the moment you must ask yourself is 72 kilometers. You must try to change this 72 kilometers to meters. To say how many meters make a kilometer, of which I don't think you're supposed to have a challenge right now, a problem. You know that 1,000 meters make a kilometer. 1,000 meters make a kilometer. So in this case, we're going to multiply by 1,000. Now, remember it's meters per second. How many seconds make an hour? Remember that 60 minutes, 60 minutes make an hour. And you know that 60 seconds make a minute. So in this case, it will be 60 multiplied by 60. So if you try to multiply this one, you end up getting 72,000 divided by 60 multiplied by 60 is 3,600. These and these will go. If you try to divide 720 divided by 336, we end up getting, I think, about uh, 20 meters per second, if I'm not made mistake. Yeah, I think 20 meters per second. So, meaning we have converted to say 72 kilometers per hour is 20 meters per second. So, meaning this is the one that we're going to use. Now, one thing that we have to understand here, you say, ah, but how come it's smaller than this? You know, what it means by this statement is say 20 meters per second. So meaning this vehicle in a, a distance of 20 meters, it, it, I mean, it covers a distance of 20 meters in one second. That's what it means, 20 meters per second. A distance of 20 meters, this motorcycle covers it in one second. 20 meters, one second, this is what it means. In this case, then when they say 72 kilometers per hour, Meaning in one hour, this motorcycle covered a distance of 72 kilometers. One hour, it covers a distance of 72 kilometers. So this is what it means. So in this case, if we try to substitute now, we do about A is equal to our final velocity to be our 20, our initial zero. What is our time? Our time is five. So if you try to work it out, 20 minus zero, end up getting 20, then divided by five. Then into this, we end up getting five into 20. Uh, which we get uh, for what are the units for acceleration is meters per square second as our final answer. So it's four meters per square second, which is our final acceleration in this case. Now, you're not done. Let's try to go back here and try to sort out this, uh, the B part here. The B part is saying how far does it travel during this time? How far? Uh, does it travel during this time? Since I do not have enough space, I'll try to hope you have copied and followed. Let me try to use this space for the second part of the question. The saying, how far does it travel during 
at the same time, you must ask yourself, what are they asking us exactly? What are we supposed to find? The moment you just hear how far, meaning we're trying to find the distance. The distance, in this case, we need to find the distance. Now, how far does it travel during this time? So in this case, since we found, we converted this one, so we'll try to put 20 meters per second. We know our initial is zero, our final velocity 20 meters per second, and time is five seconds. What else? We also know our acceleration. I think we just from finding our acceleration, and our acceleration in this case is four meters per square second. Now, since we have all this information that we have here, then we have to check around these three equations of motions, which are new. Uh, or apply in this case. I think if we check for equation one, I think we'll apply. We can try to use, I mean, sorry, equation two. We'll apply in this case equation two, and our equation two is S is equal to ut plus half a t squared. S is equal to what is our initial? This is zero. Multiply our time, five, okay, plus half. What is our acceleration in this case? Our acceleration is four. Then what is our time? Is five to the power two, which is five squared, okay? So S is equal to, you know that zero multiplied by five is zero. So we have remained with this part, which is we know that two here is one, two here is two. So we do have our two multiplied by, when you see five squared is five multiplied by five, which is get 25. Then two multiplied by 25, we end up getting 50. What are the SI unit in this case? It's meters. So, meaning this motorcycle guy, I think he, he covered a distance of about 20, I mean about 50 meters. Hope you're followed. Now, uh, there's this other equation. Let's try to work it out, whether this equation, because looking at the data that we have here, I think also this equation, we see if we're going to get 50 meters, so that we conclude whether we can use either this one or this other one. Let's try to use the second part, I mean the third equation that we have. So the third equation is see, V squared is equal to U squared plus 2AS. Now, in this case, we'll try, we know our final velocity, we know our initial velocity, we know our acceleration, but we don't know S, and that's what we're looking for. So in this case, again, we need to find, I mean, to make S the subject of the formula. So if you try to make S the subject of formula, of which I know you did in grade nine, so in this case, we say it will be S is equal to V squared minus U squared over 2A. If you try to make S the subject formula, it will be S is equal to V squared minus U squared 2A. Okay, let's try now to substitute. We'll bring it here. Our S is equal to what is our final velocity? It's 20 squared minus initial zero squared, which is the same as zero. Then what is our, our acceleration? It's four. So if you try to find 20, 20 squared, it's about, I think, 200. 20 multiplied by 20, you get zero, 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 four. Sorry, made a mistake. Zero. Zero, zero, four. Get it 400. So we have got about 400. Then two into four, I mean two multiplied by four, we end up getting eight. So meaning eight into 40, of which we end up getting five. Then bring zero, so meaning 50 meters. So we can see that uh, whether we use this equation two here or use third equation, either of the two, we'll still, up, we'll still end up getting the same answer. I think uh, we'll try to conclude by looking at the last example. There's a statement I would like to make by the end of this session here um, on what happens in a situation whereby you come across and you end up uh, having an, an answer which is a negative part. 
So let's try by try to work out this equation. I mean this question that we have. Hope I can wrap the last I mean the first part here. The last uh, this is the last question but not the least for today's work and uh, we have this one say if a car as our example three if a car if a car slows down slows down from 15 meters a second to to rest in five seconds. Calculate the retardation calculate the retardation if a car slows down from 15 meters per second to rest in 5 seconds I get the retardation so let's have our data here what does it mean when you understand say, something is retarding it's just the same as something is slowing down okay so meaning it's retarding okay it's the same as decelerate i mean you've heard about deceleration so in this case let's try to we try to work it out so we must ask ourselves what is our initial velocity our initial velocity is zero meters per second our final velocity is 15 meters per second what else have you been given in this case ah sorry sorry if a car slows down from 15 meters per second we have interchanged the two if a car slows down from 15 meters per second, meaning this is the starting point, 15 meter, to rest as our final part. So meaning in this case, our initial velocity will now be 15 meters per second. Then our final velocity is zero meters per second. What time? It took about five seconds. Five seconds as our time. Now. We have been told we try to find our retardation. So we we'll still apply this equation here to say acceleration is equal to V minus U over T. Then we substitute 0 minus 15 divided by 5, which we know to be negative 15 divided by 5. If you try to work it out, let's try to wrap this part here. We know that after substituting, we have our acceleration is equal to 0 minus 15 divided by our time, which is 5. 0 minus 15 end up getting negative 15 divided by 5. In this case, 5 into negative 15, uh, you get negative 3 meters per square second here as our acceleration now. We have been told we try to find, to calculate the retardation. The moment you introduce the word retardation, then this negative goes. So our retardation, which I'll write RET to show that it's a retarding. So RET, it will be meaning a negative goes because someone was there, I think he, when you come to your physicist, you, you'll be able to tell to say when something's retarding, then the sign goes, which is becomes meters per square second as our retardation. Now, I would like to make this take you have to take note that when you see whenever you negative sign in case that a negative sign, meaning I mean the moment you see a question, you try to work it out involving questions, I mean, or of this nature, and you end up getting an answer which is negative, it shows that this vehicle was slowing down. The moment you see a negative part, meaning this vehicle was retarding or decelerating. So the moment you see a negative, meaning this vehicle was slowing down or decelerating. Before I go, I think I do have a question for you. 
that you can try it out out there. So I do have a task that you can try out to say a body starts from rest. Starts from rest and moves, and moves with a uniform. Acceleration of two meters per square second in a straight line. line then the first question they're asking us to say what is its velocity after five seconds what is its velocity after five seconds then our B how far how far has it traveled traveled in this time. And then the last part, the last part, not least, I think after how long? After how long will the body will the body be 100 meter from its starting point. So this is the task that I have for you. So a body starts from rest and moves with a uniform acceleration of two meters per square second in a straight line. Remember, we're trying to deal with linear motion, meaning motion, I mean something moving in a straight track here. Then you have been asked, what is its velocity after five seconds? Then B, how far has it traveled in this time? Then the last but not the least, after how long will the body be 100 meters from its starting point? So just to give you a hint, on this part here, you need to find the final velocity. In the second part here, B, how far you need to find the distance covered in this particular time. Then the last part, how long will it take? That is a trying to make an assumption to say if it covered a distance of about 100 meters, how long, meaning they're asking you to find time. Just to cover this distance of 100 meters, how long it took this board to reach this 100 meters. So this is the hint that I had, please. I think thank you so much for your time. Uh, you have been with me, Mr. Banda Ray Dales. Until next time.
be taken to the position I was before it occurs. So it encourages a traders to enter into large business skills. Encourages traders to enter into large businesses. Then the next one we're going to look at class is transport. Transport is also an aid to trade. So it is the third one we're looking at. Aid transport. So now, what is transport? What is transportation? You've seen transportation, mostly you use it as you are going to school, as you are going to church, as you are moving. So what is transportation? This is the means by which goods and people are moved from one place to another. So for you to move from one place to another using a mode of transport, that is what we refer to transport because you are not stationary, you are not in one place. You are moving from one place to another. So let us write down the definition. This is the movement of people the movement of people in the woods from one place To another. Then how does transport qualify to be an aid to trade? How does it assist in this aids to trade? How does it assist in this commerce that we define as trade and aids to trade? So transport is a means by which goods and people are moved from one place to another. Then how does it assist? It assists by delivering raw materials to industries. So here are people that want to manufacture something. They would take those raw materials and, ta and take them to the industry so that they will be used or completely finished into a good that will be used by the customers. So delivering raw materials into industries. Delivering raw materials to industries. Then apart from that, transport also helps in delivering finished goods to local and international markets by means of road, sea, air, ETC. So it also helps delivering these goods that were taken to the industry since now they are, uh, they are now uh, finished goods so they can be used by the required consumer. So delivering, raw material, um, delivering finished goods to local and international markets. Delivering finished goods to local and international markets. International markets by road, sea, air, etc, etc, etc. So this is, uh, these are ways on which transport assists in commerce. The next one we're going to look at is advertising. Before we look at how it assists, we need to know the definition. Advertising. We have heard people say using this word as they are speaking. Now we need to know what it means. What is advertising class? So this is a dissemination of information about goods and services available on the market. This is simply the dissemination of information of goods available on the market. Saying so this is 
the dissemination of information. about the goods and services available on the market. And it helps by, I'm going to put a full color on it. How does advertising help in commerce? Why does it qualify to be called an ace to trade? So, informing people of various goods and services available on the market is the first role in which advertising assists in commerce. We're saying informing people of various goods and services available on the market. So, now that you're in business, how are your customers going to know that these certain goods are available on the market? How are you going to know that those goods that your customers were requesting for last week, last month, yesterday, they are now in your shop. You need to advertise to them. For them to know that, oh, these goods we requested for are now in stock. So, you need to advertise to your customers to inform them that these goods are now on the market. So this point we're saying is saying informing people of various goods and services available on the market. Informing people of the goods and services available on the market. This is the first one. The second uh, way in which advertising assists in uh, commerce is that persuading potential customers to buy goods and services by various methods of appeal. So now that you have informed your customers, you need to persuade them. You need to persuade them. You need to entice them. How are they going to buy them since they know that they're there? You need to force them by persuading, I mean, forcing them in an encouraged and argumentative way for them to buy those goods that you have informed them that they are available. So persuading potential customers to buy goods and services by various methods of appeal. Persuading customers to buy the goods and services using various methods of appeal. What do we mean by this term, methods of appeal? How are you going to reach your customers? How are you going to make them, uh, how are you going to forcefully make them buy those goods that you're advertising? Are you going to use a famous artist? Are you going to use a famous footballer so that when they see them on the television or when they hear their voice, they'll be tempted to hear what you're advertising? What is it you're going to use? Are you going to use a word of mouth? Are you going to use exhibitions? Are you going to use posters? All those are various methods of appeal on how you can reach to your customers. So the other way in which uh, advertising assists in commerce is by obtaining information on where to get the goods. So when you advertise, your customers need to obtain information where they'll buy these goods, where they'll find certain goods that have been advertised. Is it in a shopping mall? Is it in a kiosk? Anywhere. So you need to uh, obtain information, to, uh, they need to obtain information on where to get the goods. Obtaining information on where to, to get the goods. 
Then the last, last but not the least, is recruiting the required staff. So when you are in trade, and then you publish an advertisement to say, I'm advertising for this, I need a lady, I need a man who will be helping to sell this and this and this, the salary is very good. So you are going to find yourself recruiting the right members of staff to work in your organization, in your company, ETC. So recruiting the required staff. Recruiting the required staff. Then at the end, you'll find yourself appreciating this commerce and these aids to trade. So let's look at the other aids to trade. The fifth edge to trade is communication. What is communication? How does it assist in comics? So communication, this is the means through which individuals and business organizations contact or exchange information. This is the means through which individuals or business organizations contact in order to exchange information. So let us write down the definition. We're saying this is the means through which individuals and business organizations this is the means through which individuals and businesses contact and exchange information So somebody would want to know how this communication appears to be an edge to trade. How does it assist in commerce? So the first one is saying informing the public on goods and services available on the market. Informing the public on goods and services available on the market. Informing the public. on goods and services available on the market. The second way in which communication assists in commerce is that it organizes surveys to promote business activities. Because information has been passed on, people have exchanged, have exchanged what is supposed to be done, organizing surveys to promote business activities. Organizing. business surveys to promote business activities. The third way in which communication assists in commerce is that it ensures 
that raw materials and factory instructions are distributed on the market and given to the right people at the right time. So if communication has taken place in an industry, for instance, or in a factory concerning instructions, ETC, when you communicate on time and to the right people, you'd find that the right things are being done without any complaints. So ensuring that raw materials or factory instructions are conveyed to the right people at the right time. Ensuring that factory instructions are conveyed to the right people at the right time. So the last one we're going to look at under the H2 trade class is warehousing. The last one we're going to look at is warehousing. Okay, we can use this space. Which is the sixth one. What is warehousing? Somebody needs to know the definition before you know how it assists in commerce. So this is the storing or self-keeping of goods before they are used or consumed. This is the storing or self-keeping of goods before they are used or consumed. This is the storing or self-keeping of goods before they are used or consumed. Then it helps by, helps by, put a full on. How does warehousing assist in commerce, what makes it qualify to be an edge to trade? So the first one is that uh, it guards uh, people's uh, guarding of price, uh, guarding against price fluctuation by providing storage in the warehouse. What do we mean by guarding of price fluctuation? So when goods are put in a warehouse, you'd find that the prices on the market are going high. But because they have been stored in a warehouse where they were bought at a cheaper price, the price of those goods by the time they'll be released will not go high. So this is why what we mean by guarding against price fluctuation by storing goods in a warehouse. Guarding against price fluctuation by storing in a warehouse. Storing in a warehouse. Then apart from that, you'll find that these goods are being protected from bad elements. Bad elements like weather, theft, ETC. So protecting goods from bad elements like weather, fire, ETC. Protecting goods from bad weather fire ETC. So how are these goods protected from bad weather, fire, and these other natural disasters? When they are stored in a warehouse, there are some goods that get damaged when they are being exposed too much to the sunlight. The color and the quality, everything happens to depreciate. 
Then others, when they fire, they burn. Many things burn when they fire. So they are stored in a warehouse, a warehouse which is metallic or built with uh, bricks. Apart from that, certain things will be protected from theft because no one will manage to steal from them. They will be in a room where there is less ventilation and the thief cannot even manage to break in because it is fully built of metal and a small pan bricks. So a thief cannot manage to enter into a warehouse because of the security measures that are put in place. Apart from that, guaranteeing future supplies by storing goods in warehouse when they are plentiful and releasing them when they are scarce. So when goods are plenty on a market, they will store them in a warehouse. Then there will be a time when they will need them. Example, jerseys, gumboots, umbrellas. We do not use them in every season. But doesn't mean that season we are not using them. They have been thrown away or they've been burnt. No. They've been stored in a warehouse such that when they are not needed, they are kept there to protect them from these things. I said natural disasters, theft, bad weather, ATC. So when they are needed, that is when they will release them to say, now the goods are here on the market, people will start buying. So this is what happens. Uh, guaranteeing future supplies. So I need this part of the board. Guaranteeing future supplies when they are plentiful. Guaranteeing future supplies when they are plentiful and releasing them. when they are scarce. Let's look at the other way in which uh, warehousing assists in commerce. So the other one is storing goods in bonded warehouse awaiting payment of customs duty. So there are some goods which can be transported from one country to another, but uh, payment of uh, tax is not available. So they are going to store them in a warehouse and this type of the warehouse is called a bonded warehouse because it is awaiting payment of customs duty. So storing goods in bonded warehouses awaiting payment. Storing goods in warehouses, bonded, awaiting payment. Then the other thing I can talk about is that warehousing assists the manufacturers to continue manufacturing certain goods which are not, not needed on the market. Doesn't mean if at this season we're not using gum boots, then that company that manufactures gum boots has stopped. No, they have not stopped. They are continue manufacturing them until a time when we're going to need them. So these are ways in which these aids to trade assist in commerce. So the first one we looked at, let me just draw the warp tick diagram, the warp tick on the board. We have a quick summary of what we've looked at today. This is what we have looked at today. The first one, which is W, it's for warehousing, which was the last one which we looked at. Then the second one, A, it's for advertising. 
The, second, the third one is banking, or the fourth is transportation, insurance, then communication. So these are the commercial services that help trade to take place. So without this WAPTIC, commerce cannot take place. That is why you learn it, the beginning of commerce, so that you know what is involved in commerce. Because without WAPTIC, there is no commerce. Commerce which is defined as trade and aids to trade. Then these are the aids to trade. So I have been your teacher, Miss Mangilashi. Meet me next time in commerce.